Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Ask Anything Presented by Mosher Consulting. I'm your host, Angel Leon, Mosher's Director of Personnel. We're happy that you could join us for this episode of Ask Anything because today we're talking with another one of our own, John Cavanis, a senior consultant within our core technologies division. John is joining us to talk about, what else? AI. More specifically, how to take the AI journey securely and ethically. John Cavan is a senior consultant with Mosher Consulting's core technologies division and a Ball State alumni. Wait for it. Sorry, I had to unmute. Chirp, chirp. chirp. <laughs> with a master's degree in information and communication sciences. When he isn't doing his day job for Mosher, John is often finding ways to leverage emerging technologies to try to answer the question, what can we do to make things easier, better, or more efficient? And I certainly... Can't appreciate that. Let's welcome our guest, John Cavanis. John, how are you? Good. Glad to be back. It's always fun to chat with you guys. We got to keep meeting like this. Yeah, John is a repeat offender. You might remember John from our many Star Wars episodes. He's a former Star Wars trivia winner, and uh, he's been here quite a bit when it comes to that topic. But today we're not talking Star Wars. We're talking about AI. I feel like I've been talking about AI in this uh, podcast over the last few episodes, but it's been it. It's been the it topic in the tech industry for quite some time now. And today we're going to talk about how to do that journey securely and ethically. And we've kind of touched a little bit on that in our recent episodes, but today we're going to dive a little bit deeper into that topic. So John, what are some initial steps on an AI journey a company needs to take before getting started? It's important to ask, I think, you know, any company when they start thinking about this, they need to look internally and think, what are we actually trying to solve, right? There's so many generative AI tools across not just text-based generation, but video and imagery, but that's where the ethics comes in, right? How do you intentionally avoid accidentally breaching fair use or having a generated response to a question be a hallucination, as they call it in the AI industry. But it's important to ask, what are you trying to solve first? And then it's also important to know that, are you going to use a platform or are you going to build it yourself, right? If you use a platform, what does data governance look like? What does acceptable use look like for your company at that point? Because think of it this way, if you're using ChatGPT or Microsoft Copilot, you know, they have access to that data. They do have privacy statements that say they're not going to use it for anything other than training their models. But I always think there's a bit of gray area because it's such a new and exciting area in tech. There's not a lot of regulation around it, right? And as far as the ethical concerns go, you know, you've got the accidental copyright use, you've got hallucinations, inaccurate responses, and then unintentional biases and training data. If you're going with a platform, usually you can avoid a lot of that because they have engineers on the back end that are fine tuning these things. But if you're building it yourself, you have to be very careful with the data set you're using to train. And then, of course, obviously, there's cybersecurity vulnerabilities and your environmental considerations, right? So if you're hosting it internally, how are you managing the data that's going into it? How are you keeping the walls high enough and thick enough to keep the bad people out? as well as keep the good data in, right? You don't want a, a leak to appear because you have a bad integration or something like that between two systems. But I think most companies, the first step is what is our governance approach going to be? What mm. are we going with a platform or building it ourselves? And then, you know, you have to then decide how are we going to staff the people that are going to be working with this thing? If it's going to be your... IT department, for example, you might have to augment that that group with experts who regularly are in the space of high-level security, because most regular IT departments are security-oriented, but it may not be their entire focus, right? right? It may not be their strongest area, as well as if you're going to build it yourself, you probably need some data and analytics folks who are familiar with working with large data sets and getting good information out of them, because much like a Power BI report, you can have a beautiful visual, but if the data that's feeding into that report is no good, how good's that report, right? Yeah. It's the same thing with a generative AI response or any AI tool. Whatever you're putting into it is probably what you're going to get out of it, right, from a training aspect. And I think that bigger question of do we go in-house with it or do we use a platform is probably the main question to kind of feed into the rest of the logic tree 
of what you're going to do, right? So from a platform perspective, so Chat GPT is out there. Microsoft Copilot is a big front runner these days. They just recently added a Copilot for security service feature, whatever you want to call it. That is going to probably change the game for a lot of companies as far as what's their cyber response? What is their SOC doing? And giving them a bit of a leg up as far as dealing with incidents. But before anyone gets too paranoid and worried, oh, are they going to you know, replace me with an AI? As someone who plays with these things often, it takes so much to get an AI just even halfway decent to the point where a person would be able to be replaced by them, right? Most of these tools aren't even close. The forefront question that I always encourage people to think of is if you're trying to solve a certain problem, it should be helping your employees be better at their jobs rather than replacing them, right? It's one of the, there's a, I think KPMG as well as a bunch of other places have these really good like tenets of responsible AI like implementation. Fairness, transparency, explainability, accountability, reliability, security, safety, and data integrity. Those are kind of like the pillars of what is considered a responsible AI implementation. But I would think there's another one that's more grounded in the fact that this is a tool. It's not a replacement. It's right. like when you get a pocket knife, do you know what each feature on that pocket knife is and what it can be used for, right? You can't replace a person with a pocket knife. <laughs> like a, a lot of my, yeah, a lot of my friends who are like really hardcore like PowerShell guys, they're worried that someday they're not going to need that skill because AI can do it. And it's funny if I give one of those guys a question, how would you do it? And then I feed the same thing into three different AI tools. The person's still always better. Their result is always better than the AI results I've gotten. Because one, on the GPT side, their reference material is fairly, you know, there's there's big gaps in how often they're updating the source training right. data, right? So it may give you something that worked years ago, but not necessarily <laughs> something that works now. Whereas a person, they're actively using it. They hit the wall of, oh, that that approach no longer works. I need to look into this more, leverage my skills and understanding of, you know, what syntax and various like arguments might work. <clears throat> Whereas an AI is just going to spit out the high level here. You can try this. It might work. And that's my kind of problem with the chat GPTs and the platform side of it is you are going to be subject to dealing with hallucinations. If someone is going to be on the other side of that, they need to be clever enough to know I can't always rely on you. I have to double check before I do that. Like if it tells me run this script, I need to know as I'm reading that script if it's going to work, not go in blind and assume it works. That's a lot. That probably didn't answer the question directly, but you know, I could talk about this for days. So what I'm hearing is the very special episode of ASCII Anything where we have AI talk to AI about AI while on hell and I go get a coffee <laughs> is still a ways away is what you're saying. Yeah, it, but what could be cool is there are tools out there where you can take recordings of, you know, both of you have done tons of these ASCII Anything podcasts. You could train a voice AI to be your voices and talk oh. as both of you, and they could speak to each other about things that you know, you've trained them on. Would it come out perfect? Probably not. Would it be a funny thing to record and watch? Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, that'd yes. be a super funny episode because th they would have all kinds of mess, mess ups, right? I think this is a power I would abuse. So, yeah, yeah. no, I, yeah, me too. We both got <laughs> busy, busy schedules. So, I don't, <laughs> and, it, it yeah. must not fall into my hands. It yes. must not. Powers for good, right? That's the main like point I like to make with the AI stuff. It should be powers for good. But recently I was researching something. I think you guys will get a kick out of this and the listeners. There's this, you know, startup company, really clever guy on YouTube. I always watch his content because it's it's incredibly knowledgeable, right? He has all this insight about what it's like to to kind of start from nothing and build something up and become successful. I think those kinds of stories are inspiring. One of the things that he realizes is that his senior leadership himself and the middle leadership were having difficulty staying on their tasks because they were constantly getting hammered with questions that, you know, maybe their employees could could answer themselves or they just needed a sanity check from them and they found an AI tool and implemented it through their discord because they don't use slack or teams they use discord internally where 
you train a AI bot on your conversations, on your documents that you've written, you give it access to all of this stuff. And then we'll just, for this example, call it Mike. Mike bot, whenever they have a question for Mike, it goes to the bot first. So if they ask Mike, hey, what was in that uh, financial report from two months ago? It fetches it and sends it to them and then responds in a way that sounds like it's Mike. It's not actually Mike. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a paid service software as a service AI platform that's out there. The name of it escapes me right now, but those tools exist. But what is the what is the cost of basically giving all your data to this tool? Right in comparison to building it yourself. So I wanted to go back a little bit to something mm -hmm. you mentioned at the beginning about security within AI. I view security within AI as two sides, if you will. I mean, you mentioned four pillars that I think are spot on, but I think you have to have the knowledge and have the team, right, to help you with the bad actors that might want to take advantage of what you're doing within the AI space, but also, you have to be careful with the data that you're given AI. And because I, I say two sides, but I kind of translate it into one because then when you're putting the data into the AI, if you got the bad actors, they can grab that because you have to be careful with the data. We were talking with uh, Nathan about this in his episode in that some of the larger companies right now, and I think, I forget, I think it was Microsoft. I, I'm not, please don't quote me on that, that he said, or Azure, yeah, Azure, Microsoft, that he said that they're proactively not really looking at your data. They have boundaries set within the software so that mm -hmm. when you input your data, you're not really sharing it with them. They're just kind of eating it so that they can then produce what you're asking them through the prompts. Mm -hmm. so, and I think that's when we talked about it, I thought that was a neat feature. I know that he mentioned there's a way that you can actually turn that off if you want to or turn it on depending on, on how you feel about it. But I think security is key because you're not just going to be putting prompts into this. You're going to be putting data that could be organization related. Yeah. You could be putting, we use the example of people of just, you know, if I wanted to do, if I wanted to use AI, something HR related that I'm going to be putting in there, you know, people's names, probably their personal information, et cetera, mm -hmm. their addresses, da 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 We also talked about maybe creating job descriptions for these different positions, et cetera. So now you're dealing with a lot of data that's proprietary to a company that you don't know where it's going to go. And you don't know who then is going to come out from left field and trying to take that away from you. And I think that that begs an interesting question, right? So depending on your use case for an AI tool, is it better to go platform or build it yourself? Right. And thankfully, there's plenty of build-it-yourself approaches at the moment. One, you could start entirely from scratch, build your own large language model. I couldn't tell you how to do that. As much as I research, I'm not a data scientist. I know there's plenty of documentation out there on how to do it. But what I usually look for is a, a platform that has the kind of foundational groundwork already created that you can then train and build upon right? A couple of good ones have stood out recently to me as far as like build it yourself approaches. VMware, which is a historically an incredibly, basically a household name in the IT realm mm -hmm. or virtualization. Yep. Um, historically, it's mostly hypervisors and virtual servers. They've recently introduced VMware Private AI, which essentially allows you to build it yourself internally on your virtual servers just like any other server in an IT stack. It would just be part of your vSphere environment. And then you can protect it at the local level. And there's no data going back to VMware related to what you're putting into it in training. That's entirely owned by you. You govern it. There's no one else with their fingers in the mix by any stretch. And then there's the more open source route. Obviously, that's more of your budget friendly potentially more focused on things like customer service. So if you looked at something like olama.ai, it's a little limited. In my testing, there's a lot of different models, which to kind of simplify an explanation, you have different models that go with the platform. So like olama has a few, like llama2, code llama, but other models exist. Like there's one that's particularly made to be coverage of different languages called neural chat. So say, for example, like Angel, I, I know you're bilingual, I am as well. If I wanted to keep up my German skills, I could speak with a AI bot in German 
and have it mm. kind of be my conversation partner rather than a person. And that's yeah. just like one small example. But in a customer service realm, you could feed it things like, how should I answer this email to sound more professional or help me refine this response right. in this email? Copilot does a lot of that. But that's not a, a private built. That's using a platform. Right. But that's a um, really cool tool because I'll, I mean, I'm going off here on this little curve, but Spanish is language that is spoken in many different countries and it's different in each and every one of those countries. I mean, I, I've told the story a thousand times about how when I moved out of Puerto Rico and I went to Colombia, the word that they used for trash can was a word that we use that loosely translated in English to flask. <laughs> uh, so it was to me it was like wait a second you're calling that a trash can no that to me is a flask is what we would call in english a flask for them it was a trash can and so among many other words so it's kind of interesting that you mentioned that because then that means that if i wanted to really communicate in that type of spanish and say if i wanted to talk with somebody with spain spanish you know spain mm -hmm. spanish um, rather than use my own, and I want it to sound more culturally appropriate, making sure that I'm using the right words, et cetera, that they use in that country, then I could use this tool to tell it, hey, I need you to type this email with this information and in utilizing Spain Spanish. Yeah, and I, I will say like in my testing, like some of the things I'm excited for long-term is improvements on the, the bilingual use, yeah. right? Most yeah. of them are typically trained in English. Other ones are in languages that I don't know, right? Like Chinese, Russian, right. et cetera. But I think over time that will become a huge asset just to the, the linguistics departments of the world and the, you know, the high schools that exist that are teaching foreign languages to their students. They could someday leverage these tools to give their people an interactive way to increase their skills. And I agree with something you said just a, just a couple of minutes ago about how you can use it to really chat with it and kind of make sure your your skill set, your language set doesn't go away. I mean, I can I learned French 10, 12 years ago and I don't speak it or don't use it at all right now. So we were just we took a vacation uh, last month and we happened to take a cruise and it stopped in France and and uh yeah, I can read French and in my head, I can say the words how I think they sound, because I remember some of the rules around the French language. But if you ask me to speak it, we're going to have a problem. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like I can read it. I, I learned French in high school, but I can't I can't speak a lick. Right. Yeah. Like I even spent about a month in France with a friend and the whole time he and I would talk in either English or German. And then he had to basically translate for whoever was around. Right. Because right. All I could say was, can you pass me the wine? Right. Yeah. I could never I could never say anything like too intelligent, you know, in yeah, important phrase. I took French from sixth grade through 12th grade and then two years in college. I mean, I was I was fluent and I had not spoken it regularly since 1998. And so wow. now um, a couple of years ago, one of my son's soccer teammates, his mother is from France. So I introduced myself and it's like and my wife and I quickly realized that I have gone from fluent to I live in a yellow house. I like dogs. <laughs> Bread. Yeah, <laughs> like, right? Like, and, oh, like, it's yeah. gone. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't used it. It's gone. It's, what, it's, like a, it's like water in a bucket. If you leave it out, it's going to evaporate. You got to keep adding yeah, drops, yeah, right? Yeah, and, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm hopeful because I have seen a, while we're on this language tangent, I have seen that the VR space and the gaming space has started to create like language learning games like a little bit more elevated than Duolingo, obviously. Mm -hmm. But um, like there's a VR one out on Steam at the moment where you can essentially pick a language and then you have to like tactically interact with things. You have to vocally interact with things and it helps That's you learn the language that way, right? As I was speaking with her over the season, like I was, it, it came back mm -hmm. faster. It came back much faster than originally learning, but it was just still was like, I used to be so much better at this and yeah, it hurts. just had <laughs> zero chance to use it for 20 years or more. And it's just like, nope, that's okay. That's gone. <laughs> but it's, it's always crazy to see all the, you know, on the news, you'll see a lot of both kind of the, the tinfoil hat stuff about AI and how it's bad and how it's going to end up stealing 90% of people's jobs. But then there's all the inspiring stuff 
across one of my favorite things that I've started to see coming out of the AI world that isn't necessarily technical is the AI generated art. Some of it's really good. It takes a lot of skill to hone a prop to get a good response, but there's also a problematic nature of what is that AI trained on? Is it accidentally right. stealing things? You know, that's going to be the kind of ongoing question. I'm excited to see what regulation comes out to either help or inhibit those problems, right? If you're using a paid for service, like not like Dolly, but there's a couple other ones out there where I think Mid Journey is a good example. It's a paid service. You give it a subscription. They have guardrails, obviously, because it's a tool, so you can't do anything with it. But there have been cases where people will say, I made this with Mid Journey. And then you'll see online where, hey, that's my art. What are you doing? You know, so that's kind of a tricky, tricky spot. I think over time, as this continues to evolve, more and more companies are going to see the opportunities just for simple stuff, right? Like I would love it if everyone on my team had the capability to leverage generative AI to give better customer service or help them troubleshoot, give them access to questions that only I can answer at the moment. Like if I could train something on myself and provide them basically an AI clone of me, I would, but I don't think that's always the right move just because I think that human interaction is still going to be important in the AI era. Not only is it going to be the people curating the AIs, making sure they are not biased, giving you hallucination responses, but also maintaining that human connection with your fellow coworkers, your clients, if you're in the space that we're in. Because as things get more technologically advanced, humanity always changes. We saw that with cell phones. We saw that with the internet. We're going to see that with AI. People are going to change because of this revolution. But I think the human aspect of IT and AI is the same. Yeah. Um, there's always going to need to be a person involved. There's never going to be an, an outright replacement for a person, at least not in the time that I can see anytime soon. Because in testing a lot of these tools and having conversations with other enthusiasts, a lot of us are frustrated that maybe we're not prompt engineers, but there's a lot of prompt engineering out available online right now, but we still can't always get it to do exactly what we want. And that's usually a limitation of training data or a bad prompt, right? So I think something that would be interesting to see happen, I would imagine in the next 15 years, would be schools starting to teach, you know, in computer science classes, how to do AI prompting. I hope or so. How, yeah, how to, how to engineer an AI, how to, how to be the, the person on the back end, making sure that the AI tool doesn't give a bad response. Or, yeah. you know, for that one example, uh, I like to pick on this example because it, it kind of shows a blind spot in a lot of data science. You know those lights that come on when you go into a room and right. it's based on a sensor. Those sensors are were historically trained on a certain type of person. If you weren't that certain type of person, they wouldn't recognize you. That same training issue is what a lot of the AI space has to fix. and A lot of data spaces have to fix. How do you fix that? You have to get better data. To right. get better data, people have to start giving you data or you have to go get and create uh -huh. that data. Because like I'm currently working with Copilot, right? I have the ability to create a Copilot custom made right now. One of the, the hardest things as someone building this tool out is recognizing that the generative aspect of this tool is good, but can I give it a better result, question response experience by building it myself and creating my own topics and triggers? And it's difficult to imagine every scenario where a person might ask it a question. There's 50 ways to ask one question. Imagine trying to get it to be able to answer 100 questions. You're basically writing a book without putting punctuation. You yeah. Know? But there's definitely room to grow in this space. I think young folks who are trying to get into IT they're definitely going to be very capable in this space because it is so new, right? Mm. And I think people that are seasoned vets are going to have a lot of value to add as well because they know what's worked historically as far as a question response. And I think the opportunities for the space that the space presents are really going to be vast for our future generations, even those that are in school right now. I mean, I have a nine-year-old and I have a two-year-old who I hope as you were mentioning that schools really take this on and don't let it just breeze by and let, you know, the adults in the room take over because I think it's a neat opportunity to really get kids into, you know, into AI, but really into STEM fields, into really tech, into all this cool new stuff that, I mean, I keep telling my nine-year-old like, Hey, like you should start taking coding classes, start taking 
all these different things that they offer at school because this is where the world is going. You know, but of course he's into Fortnite. I can't get him off Fortnite. That's <laughs> neither here nor there. But I jokingly say that, but I tell them like, hey, you see Fortnite, right? You like it. You could become one of those people that make a game like Fortnite and you can make it so that people maybe in the future can talk to the game. Maybe in the future can do all these different things that you can imagine that right now are really possible because of AI. There's many things out there that you can do that when I was growing up, I couldn't do in any of these games. I mean, now it's completely different, but the opportunities that this present right now are really, I think, very vast. And hopefully educators and, you know, not just schools, but universities are really taking advantage of that and really pushing the boundaries on our brains really to kind of just come up with, like you were saying, I mean, prompt engineers, I mean, that that is something that I think about and it's actually kind of a cool job. I mean, to be quite frank, it'd be something, if I really had a brain for it, I'd probably be doing it because oh, yeah. it really is cool. Like all the things that these guys are, are going to come up with in the next few years is going to be amazing. And so I'd rather be part of that because like, think about it. This is 20 some odd years ago before Y2K and all that stuff. And Brian will probably remember this. I mean, everybody was freaking out because, oh, Y2K, like the computers are going to, they're all going to die. Like nobody in the tech world was really freaking out. because It was you know? understood. You know, there, yeah. was, there was an understanding around it. And I think that's why people are so afraid of AI right now. Right. Those right. things that scare folks are based on a lack of understanding or exposure. I know that with Google's Gemini, that can be integrated directly into your phone like Siri, right? In my testing with Gemini previously, Bard, it's really good for certain things. Like if, if you're trying to refine something in a document, it's amazing. If you're trying to get a question and answer, it's pretty good. If you're trying to code and program, it's going to have a couple misses, but it might lead you down a path, right? It might show you, oh, this is another way to consider it. But I think what I've found the most, so this is, this is a fun real world story. I've got Copilot. I've got a giant Excel document. Hey, how can I get some information out of this that makes sense? Ask it a couple questions. It makes me some pivot tables. I'm thrilled. What's the next step? Oh, I have to present on this topic. I can ask Copilot to make a presentation from the data in the Excel document, saving me hours of time, where all I have to do is go back through and check it and improve it rather than start right. from scratch entirely. That's a real simple use case, but that's just one small example of how this sort of thing can make people more efficient, how it can yeah. make their lives better. Yeah. I think we can all, and listeners might agree, the less time I have to spend making a PowerPoint, the better. You know, I think everybody um, would agree would yeah. agree on that. And to go back to Gemini for a second, mm -hmm. I had never used it until I believe I spoke with Nathan on it. And so I went on there and I did a couple prompts just to see it because I have been using chat GPT. I think everybody, everybody has by now. The one thing I will give Google is the results that you get are backed by Google results right underneath it. So I think that's really cool. Obviously, when you get chat GPT, you just get the response, the write up, and that's it. But I could really appreciate kind of having that feedback of, hey, this is where I got your data from. This is like, I asked it a silly question. I think it was, how do you come up with a proper, what was it? I think it was a proper hiring managing process. Just something, something to that effect. And then it yeah. gave me like a 15 step process and it really broke it down. Every step it had like three or four bullet points to that step. And then it went to the next one. And then all the way to the bottom, I saw all the results that it came with. Here's where I got all the data. And so it, it cited like 20 different sites, universities, et cetera. And I thought that was really cool because that to me tells me, okay, I'm asking you this question and you're not just coming up with it out of th thin air. Obviously it's AI. So you know, mm -hmm. it, it has learning to do, but at least it gave me the citations of the places it went to actually get all this data and give me what looked like really a four or five page answer and really well written. And I mean, some of the stuff, yeah, like you mentioned, it's a little bit of hallucinating, but in a perfect world, you don't really use 15 steps. No, but, yeah, of course. But you could see, you could see where it was going. Let's, uh, we kind of, we kind of veered off of the topic, but let's, let's bring it back here in a second, here sure. a second. So what makes an AI implementation ethical versus unethical? I think you, you've touched a little bit on it with some of the answers and some of your stories, but what makes that ethical versus unethical? Yeah. And I think that kind of goes back to the idea that it's a tool, right? If you're trying to replace people, that's, that's extremely tricky, but there's also more to consider as far as ethics from a data perspective. 
kind of like that bias sensor problem that they've since solved in yeah. that field. I think one of the ethical concerns around AI is, okay, so you're training it on data. Are you verifying that there is an implicit bias in there? Is there data that it's truly accurate representations of reality? Because if you're feeding it a bunch of nonsense, it's going to give you nonsense, right? Yep. But additionally, there has to be accountability around using AI tools. That's why I think if any company is going to start formally going down an AI journey, they need to dedicate a team of people to be around that tool so that when there is some kind of problem that surfaces based on using that tool, there's a direct line to a person. I hesitate to assert that we should treat AI like people, mostly because people should be the ones held accountable, not the AI. If you're going with a platform, whoever makes that platform is probably accountable for whatever that circumstance of misuse or, right. you know, problems might be. But if it's an in-house thing, there has to be a direct line between we found a bias, we found a hallucination, what do we do about it, how do we fix it, who's in charge of that? As well as like, it has to be developed in a way where it can be explained. If you implement an AI tool in your company and you can't explain it well to your employees or your customers, depending on what you're doing with it, people are not going to trust it. It's going to be bad for your reputation. It has to be very transparent and explainable in the sense that there's a clear understanding of what's happening with the solution. Because if you keep it wrapped up in the dark and don't make it entirely obvious that, hey, this is an AI tool about a person and they find out, that's an issue. So ethics is usually centered around, in the AI space, it's centered around you know responsibility, accountability, transparency, human-centric focus, right? So not replacing people with machines. And then legal problems. You don't want to accidentally get into a legal problem because of an AI tool. That's why there is a benefit to a lot of the platforms in the sense that they will, if you ask chat GPT for medical advice, man, it will very quickly tell you it's not a doctor, but here's right. some stuff to think about. If you're building a homegrown solution and you know your employees start asking questions that aren't necessarily in the scope of what you've built, you better have something in there that says, hey, I don't know about that. Here's something you can look into. But you have to have a good way of ensuring that the bounds of what's accurate or what's actually in the focus of that AI's purpose are direct and obvious. And it's not like a question of, oh, well, I mean, it told me I could do this. That makes it my doctor now, right? No, like it's not, it's not how it works. And then the last thing on this, because it is important, and data governance is a constant across all of IT. If you're right. following a compliance standard, if you're seeking to do certain work, there are certain, you know, we always make the checkbox exercise joke for a lot of these things, but there are serious concerns if you're going into the AI space because there aren't technically a lot of regulatory governance standards for this stuff yet, right? It's so new, there's not much law around it other than what applies to previous things, much like law right. always, it always evolves from previous cases as far as the U.S. goes. Data governance is important. Who's got access to it? To what level can they access it? When you brought up earlier the ability to turn on and off the data anonymization, I think was kind of what you mm -hmm. were referring to. And you can turn that feature on and off. At the moment, I personally don't know. I don't know if there's a problem with turning that off. But would I ever want to turn it off for a purpose that it may need to be turned off for? Say you're talking to whatever platform hosts that, you get a bad result, you turn that on so they can help you figure out where it went wrong. Mm -hmm. is what it, where my head goes. That's my kind of like right. imagined circumstance. But I would imagine within the next 10 to 15 years, companies that have already taken the AI journey are going to have to be ready for the fact that, oh, there's a new standard out. There's new regulation out around AI use. We need to make sure that we can take whatever we've built or purchased and ensure that it follows those regulations, those standards that are going to eventually emerge, right? Mm -hmm. Because... That's where it gets complicated. As just with general basic IT, reaching compliance standards is complicated. When you start talking yeah. about something as nuanced and intense as AI, I'm sure it only gets even more exponentially complicated. So let's talk about platforms. You mm -hmm. mentioned a few earlier, but what platforms would you recommend companies start off with? Or would you recommend going with a homegrown one? And I'm assuming that really has to do with what they're going after. What type of data they have? What are they really going to be doing with it and, and what, what kind of response do they want? 
I think, you know, if it's a, I'll, I'll throw a couple of use cases out. If you're going for productivity improvement for your employees, I think Copilot is a really solid, easy to implement solution for a lot of companies. You already have the Microsoft suite. As long as you build policies and acceptable use internally at your organization, using something like Copilot, it's a pretty easy, easy run. You give people guidelines on what they can and can't say with it, what they can and can't do with it. And it's a pretty straightforward implementation from a platform standard. If you're going for productivity, but you don't want to use a Microsoft Copilot or Google Gemini, depending on what your technical preferences are, you know, starting from scratch might be the way to go. Would that be something that your run-of-the-mill internal IT group can just do on the fly? Probably not, right? You might need right. to reach out to some experts. You might need to seek advice from folks who have already done it. And additionally, building and training something like olama.ai is good, but it might be better to go with something like VMware's private AI. I know that there's probably 15 competitors for that solution, but I like to talk about that one because I've watched a lot on the solution itself. It's very robust. There's a lot of integrity from VMware historically in my mind. When I've had to work with them in the past during crises or sales for places, they've always been a good vendor as far as giving you the ability to move forward, especially if you have high goals. But a couple of things that I would say from a use case perspective for VMware private AI is code generation. So that'd be supporting your team that works on coding things for whatever goals your business uses, customer service, you know, contact centers, service desks, IT departments out there, they could leverage this tool to enhance, you know, their knowledge base articles, their client or customer experience, feedback collection, quality of uh, delivered work. Another use case, which a friend of mine actually does this, and I I can't get him to tell me much about it because he, he loves the fact that he built this. He manages a large network for a company. He has created a network engineer AI that essentially will tell him when change needs to be made in the network for whatever reason. There's an outage, there's a problem, et cetera. He gets a notification and it's a yes or no, can I do this? He hits yes, it goes and makes the changes. He wow. doesn't have a network engineer. He has a network engineer AI. Um, it's a small company, but they have a lot of locations, but he's basically a two-man IT team for this place. It's not like he needs to have another person when they never had that person in the first place. So he built this right. out. Incredibly clever, clever guy. And then last but not least with the VMware private AI, advanced information retrieval. If there's reference material that the company's built up over the 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 years of being in existence. Yes, you can do that with databases. Yes, you can do that with a search feature. But is it more prudent to ask, have we ever done something with XYZ company? And then if you built it properly, it could retrieve every single receipt of anything that was ever discussed with that place if it had access to it. Oh. That could save time in a legal circumstance, a troubleshooting circumstance, all kinds of circumstances where just those or small use cases are enough to completely change the makeup of a company's processes. It's always crazy to think of what you can do because it is kind of a sky's the limit situation, depending yeah. on what level of effort you're willing to put into it. To make a private co-pilot, like not a private, like a custom co-pilot in Microsoft, it's a high level of effort. One, you have to go through the rigors of creating the topics and triggers that it responds to. Then you have to go through the process of how do I publish it? Where am I going to integrate it? What exactly are we going to give this thing and what are we going to use it for internally? But if you just get some co-pilot licenses and push that out to the company, your workforce is probably going to work a little bit more productively, if I had to guess, because they have this incredible tool that allows them to do more. I think last I checked, the co-pilot licenses are a little steep at the moment. I would imagine that's going to come down in, well, the, yeah. <laughs> in the near future, maybe. We'll see. As more competition gets into the field, that's likely the easiest one as far as a useful, easy-to-implement AI solution that could help a business. Long-winded answer to a pretty complex question, but hopefully at least a little bit of that was helpful. Yeah, I mean, and, and when you look at the tools that are going to be available for the workforce in order to really benefit with AI, not replacing like you mentioned earlier, but really benefiting, I mean, benefiting because you're going to be able to do so much more 
in a quicker amount of time. Like the example you mentioned about making the PowerPoint presentation, maybe you have this this big write-up and you want to highlight the the key information because you want to talk about it in a company meeting. So here's this 20 page document. Hey, can you highlight the top 10 most important things? And boom, there it is. So now you don't really need to be writing on a little card as well. This is what I'm going to talk about. These, these are my bullet points. Now AI can really sum it up together for you. Maybe you have to do a little bit of editing, but it's probably going to be one fourth of what you were going to probably do 10 and 15 years ago on your yeah. own and like so, another thing with that document example like say you're pushing a large policy out internally for some change right you have yeah. some goal you're you're working towards it you've created all this documentation collateral you can tell microsoft copilot in this example we'll go with hey i need an faq for this document it's going to read it. It's going to see what may or may be compli- what may or may be complicated <laughs> to understand, and then list that out as yeah. when does this policy come into effect, or what does this mean for me? You know, and it's going to try to answer those. But it's always kind of a springboard, right? It shouldn't be taken as a final result. It no, no, absolutely not. Human eyes. I think that's one of the bigger things to always recommend is like whenever it's AI stuff, have a sanity check by a real person to make that's, sure it's good. Yeah, that's and yeah. that's I think. The number one thing I've learned through this last year and a half since AI kind of grew to where it is right now and it continues to keep growing is whatever result you get from that prompt, make sure you read it, make sure you're okay with it. And if not, obviously make your edits. Don't take it for, oh, this is golden. This is exactly what I need. No, because like you said, sometimes you might need to tailor it to the audience that's going to read it. And so you don't want it to, sound or read like a robot made it for you you don't want it to yeah. sound like that you want it to sound like a human really did it and i gotta do give credit i mean obviously what we get from chat gpt and gemini i mean you know for the free versions right i know that there's a paid mm-hmm. version for every one of these prompt makers you know but are they really any better than the free versions i don't, I don't know i've never tested one so i don't In know my experience i had a gpt pro premium whatever they called it subscription for about two months and before that i was using the free version for quite some time i ended up dropping the premium because i wasn't leveraging it for what the features really were right like if you're just looking for like that text-based prompts call and response conversational input from it you're basically at the same tier with the regular stuff yeah but one of the things that was cool about GPT Pro is you could create an agent, which is basically their version of Copilot, or maybe Copilot's their version of an agent. But essentially, you could make a goal-oriented agent. It would train itself on things you told it, and it could improve itself to then give you better responses on that topic. So say, for example, you really want to know everything there is about car brake technology, right? Just okay. over time, you're maybe you're trying to write a book about brakes. I don't know. You could train a GPT agent to pull as much as it can and stay hyper-focused on that one topic. And then you could ask it questions as you're writing your novel. You know, when was the first brake put into a car? What was it like? What was the, who invented that? How different is that system compared to what is currently in place? And it could probably give you pretty good answers. And the thing that, you know, you'd have to double check is do a couple Googles, make sure it's good but it would at least give you something to jump off of. Instead of you doing that research, you can then use it as your kind of stepping stone into continued research. Right. Right. It's just crazy what all you can do out there. And I think this is a fun one to bring up because for the gamers out there, everybody knows the game Skyrim. It's been around for Mm -hmm. quite a long time. Yep. The modding community is incredibly bright and they're always doing interesting things. Something that I saw in the past six months or so, maybe the past year, is someone figured out how to make a mod where all the NPCs in the game now use a GPT-based response, you know, whenever you talk to them or interact with them, and then fed those responses into a trained voice model based on those NPCs' voices from the game to then enhance the amount of dialogue options with the characters in the game. To me, that's crazy. If I was a game developer, if I was a, a D&D enthusiast, I would be losing my mind at the fact that you could augment your game design, your voice team, who's helping with the voice acting. You could integrate all of that to create a better game experience, Mm -hmm. right? It's just incredible what people have done in so little time with these tools. So I think it's only going to get more interesting. But 
there is a dark side, right? And I want to touch on that before we get out. The dark side of AI is that there's bad actors using bad AI to write better malware, get better intrusion methods to do harm to businesses. That's a real thing. I think that's where most of the reckoning is going to come for the AI era is how do you control malicious use? Yeah. What do you do about malicious use? Because hackers are clever. As soon as a tool gets out, just like way back in the day when trains were on the road and everyone was riding horses and they were knocking over trains to get loot, that development of tool use is always going to have a dark side. What are regulatory bodies going to do about it? What is law enforcement going to be enabled to do about it? Mm -hmm. um, that's going to be an interesting thing to watch happen over the next you know, 10, 15 years. Might be sooner, might be later, but there's definitely going to have to be some sort of you know, mindset about what's acceptable AI use and then what is illegal AI use, right? Because right. at the moment, I think that's a bit of a gray area in some yeah. aspects. All right. So before we go, any advice for anyone out there who might be thinking about implementing AI in the organization? Yeah, I'd, here's the big three. Definitely have a plan. Definitely do your research, right? So who's going to be running it internally? Are you going to use a platform? What What's the goal that you're shooting to fix, right? The second one I would say is, do you already have a governance plan for your data that you have at your organization? If you don't, you probably don't want to do this yet. You need to get that sorted out before you move into this area. And then the third one would be, how good is your current security as far as your IT goes? Much like the thing about governance, these are kind of essentially related. If you have security concerns with your current IT implementation, moving into the AI space is only going to be more complicated because you don't have an approach already for when bad things happen, right? Mm -hmm. You need to have those walls built before you can start making the garden, so to speak. But I think those are the big three that I would recommend people contemplate before taking this this leap into the future. All right. And with that, we'd like to thank John Cavanis for joining us today to talk about how to securely and ethically start your AI journey. John, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Great to be here as always, guys. See you soon. Thank you for listening in to this week's edition of Ask Anything presented by Motion Consulting. We hope you enjoyed listening to John Cavanis talk to us about how to securely and ethically start your AI journey. Join us next time when we continue to dive deeper with our resident experts and what they're currently working on. Remember to send us your ideas or topics via our social media feeds. In the meantime, please remember to give us a rating and subscribe to our feed wherever you get your podcasts. Until then, so long, everybody. Go.